Think for yourself and question authority. Think for yourself and question authority. Today's focus is about authority, and so we'll be getting into that in a little bit. But this idea of think for yourself and question authority really helps us to think about our individual self and our rugged individualism and the me, myself, and I. We want to offer you a warm welcome and we want to invite you to think not only about the me, the I, but also about the we and us. And so we have invited you to think about this meditation, think for yourself and question authority, right alongside of the affirmation of community. And this is something that we have borrowed a couple of times from First Congregational United Church of Christ in Memphis. And so we want to invite you to share that with us as we move a little bit out of that place of me, myself, and I to think more about community and our commitment, our covenant, our connections with each other. We will be together. We will stand as brothers and sisters given life by one God. We will be together. We will watch out for one another. We will listen to what needs to be said in a spirit of compassion. We will respect the power of silence. We will wait for the slowest. We will sooner or later catch up with the fastest. We will dry the tears of those who are weeping and know that they will dry ours when the time comes. We will let ourselves begin to feel at least a little of the pain of those we have considered our enemies. We will entrust our stories to each other. We will not be skeptical that peace can come. We will not forget the joy of life. We will not forget to be grateful. We will do our best to stir in each other hope, courage, and faith. And as a community, as ones who are committed to the other, we invite you to find ways where you are now or through the Spirit to pass the peace of Christ with one another.
Our first reading this morning is from the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses is speaking with the Israelites. The Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from your community, from your fellow Israelites. This prophet is the one who you must listen to. That's exactly what you requested from the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, I can't listen to the Lord my God's voice anymore or look at this great fire any longer. I don't want to die. The Lord said to me, what they've said is right. I'll raise up a prophet for them from among their fellow Israelites, one just like you. I'll put my words in their mouth and they will tell them everything I command them. I myself will hold accountable anyone who doesn't listen to my words, which that prophet will speak in my name. Please join us in our call to worship. Come with thoughts and beliefs that are old and new. Come with words and ways that have been handed down to us generation to generation. Come with what you have, with who you are. We also come with open hands, hearts, and spirits that we might experience fresh expressions and experiences of faith, even as we appreciate and honor our ancestors. Come with respect, deference, and a sense that you don't know it all, that you haven't figured it all out. We come with a healthy suspicion of authority and with a desire to think for ourselves Come with your convictions, your questions, your willingness to compromise, and chart a course together. We come with eagerness and a bit of trepidation. Come, for the holy is always waiting for you, and grateful for your focus and intentionality. Let us worship our God together, Creator, Christ, and Spirit. Thank you. 
Please join us in our opening prayer, which is our United Church of Christ Statement of Faith. We believe in you, O God, eternal spirit, God of our Savior Jesus Christ and our God, and to your deeds we testify. You call the worlds into being, create persons in your own image, and set before each one the ways of life and death. You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, you have come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to yourself. You bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding and covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. You call us into your church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, your presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in your realm which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto you. Amen. Well, immediately after worship today, we will be having our annual budget meeting. And so we're going to be talking about money. We're going to be talking about the things that are important to us and how do we get them done. And one of the ways that we get them done is by using our money, using our resources, by putting some things behind our dreams and our hopes, by putting into action some of the things that we hear God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit telling us to do. And so I brought some money with me today. And, you know, if you were here, I was just going to throw it all around. Sorry that you're not here. So these are coins uh, from a lot of different countries in the world. And they are different sizes and different shapes. Uh, they are different ages, uh, made of different things. And they're kind of neat to look at especially the ones that I don't understand. They're just cool to look at the things on there, the pictures, the designs, the people's faces, the parts of nature, the languages that are used that I don't understand at all. And then here are some coins that you know from the United States. And then I also have some paper money. Uh, this is from Ireland. This one is from Yugoslavia. That's an old. And then I have some dollars and a five and a 20. And if you've ever looked at the dollar bills or the coins, you see words and numbers. There are some signatures on some of them. And you just kind of think about where they were made and why they were made. And sometimes you think about all the people that have touched them, and then you kind of want to go grab that hand sanitizer again. But the bills say, in God we trust, and the coins say, in God we trust. Sometimes they say, e pluribus unum, which is, again, another language. And that means from many, one. So that whole dream and that vision that actually is God's too, it's a thing that we hold in common, the United States of America's dream that all would be one. Uh, it's kind of fun to have all of this 
in one place. And today we're going to be talking about money and about how we use it. And it's important for us to look at it and to wonder together what are the messages that we can see right there on our money. In God we trust, e pluribus unum from many, one. And so the next time you are thinking of using some money, uh, think about what it might mean that it talks about trusting God and from many, one. Think about what it is that it says about how you look at things in the world and how important they are by the resources and the money that you put behind them. How you use your money as you think about your needs, as you think about your wants, as you think about the needs and wants of others. And so today in our church, we're gonna be meeting and talking about how we listen to the Spirit of God, how we put love into action, how we take care of each other, and how we take care of people that are not part of the church family because we all are sisters and brothers no matter what coins or bills or languages or cultures or religions or traditions that we use. So please pray with us. Holy One, today on an annual budget meeting, we give you thanks that we all come with our own gifts to give. And we all come with our own hungers and thirsts. We all come with our own pain and doubts. We come with our own gifts and strengths. Help us to bring it all together, God, from all one, from many one. And help us to trust you and trust each other as we work together to bring more love and care and kindness and generosity into the world. Amen. Our second scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Mark. It's from the first chapter. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. May God help us to find truth and guidance in these words. Holy One, indeed, help us to hear your scripture stories, to hear your Bible, to hear your word, and to find the truth there for us, and to find guidance for us, not only as individuals, but truth and guidance for us as a community, as a people. Help us, O oh God, to open all of our senses that we might find that truth and receive that guidance. Amen. So, 
What are you doing Tuesday? You're probably thinking, all right, Tuesday, what is Tuesday? What is today? Today's Sunday. Uh, Tuesday is February 2nd, so Groundhog's Day. Some people get really excited about Groundhog's Day. You may or may not be one of those people waiting to see what happens with that groundhog. Is there going to be a shadow scene? Will there be six more weeks of winter or will spring come sooner? I hope there's some snow today while we're talking about it. You know, I heard that the groundhog is usually wrong. So more often than not, the groundhog is wrong. And so I thought, you know what we should do then? We should do the opposite. We should believe the opposite of what Punxsutawney Phil does. Because if that groundhog is more often wrong, then let's just flip it. Let's do the opposite of what we see. So sometimes we have to decide who is the authority? What do we believe? How do we put our trust, how do we put our faith, how do we put our future into something else or someone else? It's a silly example of the groundhog, but we do it all the time. We have to decide to whom do we put our authority and our allegiance and our trust and which, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's A or B, groundhog or not. So we're thinking about our music here in worship, and so we have our red hymnal, we have our blue songbook, and some of you prefer the red hymnal. Some of you prefer the blue. Some of you are somewhere in the middle, or that's not really something that you are too concerned about. And when you look at these two, you need to figure out, how do I make that decision? How do I make one of them my go-to book? Do I have to make one of them? my go-to book. And so you might look at the size, you might look at the age, you might look at how long they've been around, you might listen to the tunes, you might look at the images, you might figure out who created it and how it ended up here. So we read a couple of scripture passages this morning and they were from different translations of the Bible. These aren't actually the ones that they came from, but you have to decide sometimes too, like when you hear scripture, which translation do you use? Which one do you consider your authority? Is it one that's been around a long time that was given to you by previous generations? Or is it a scripture translation that has come out more recently that is believed to have more scholarly research put into it? Looking at other things that were written at those times and looking at where certain words were used and learning more about the definitions of those words because of what that word meant when it was used somewhere else. So which one do you give authority to? Which one do you say, that's the one that I believe most? That's the one that I follow? We say, whenever we read scripture in worship, and it doesn't matter what translation it comes from, we say, may God help us to find truth and guidance in these words, because that's really what we're trying to figure out. What is truth? What is true for us? What will guide us and shape us and form us and lead us and encourage us? So some people like when I wear my robe and stole. Some people think that shows some authority and that is what I come to worship for. I wanna see that uh, tradition and I wanna see that history and I wanna see that authority and that person who's saying, trust me, believe me. Others prefer that there's no robe. Others prefer that there's no tie. Others prefer a more informal kind of presentation. Talking more like individuals who are just trying to find truth, just trying to find guidance together, in it together, belonging to each other, searching and struggling and growing and grappling together. So what is your go-to news source? So some of us, like the newspaper, they, we like to touch it and to smell it and to feel it and maybe even to have some of the ink on us later. Some people like the radio, some like TV, some type, type to look online, some people like certain bloggers, some people like podcasts. We find our news sources, we find our authority for what's happening in the world in different places. Maybe it's not a resource like that at all. Maybe it's a neighbor 
or a friend that we think they've got it figured out and they do that work to find out what's happening in the world and what to believe. Some of us use daily devotions and a word of the day or poetry of the day to also find some truth and to find some guidance that maybe doesn't speak particularly to that moment of what's happening in the community or in the world, but speaks to something larger, something deeper, something wider than the moment. And so we might look to another way of getting input. Abraham Heschel said, when I was young, I admired clever people, but now that I'm old, I admire kind people. When I was young, I admired clever people. Now that I am old, I admire kind people. And so we have to decide whom do we follow and who's our authority and who helps us to figure out, helps us to discern what to be about, what to say, what to do, where to go, how to use our resources, how to use our time. Authority is the thing we're thinking about today because in the scripture verses from our lectionary text, the three-year cycle of readings, we come upon this moment again early in Jesus' ministry where people experience him for the first time and they are dumbfounded. They are in awe of his ability, not just by what he says, but by what he does and how what he says and what he does align. And they are overwhelmed in this particular New Testament lesson today, the Gospel of Mark tells us, about Jesus' authority and how he teaches and how he comes with a new authority. And so we might think, what is authority? And so authority sometimes is looked at as the powers that be, right? And authority is the one who makes the rules and make the law, the one who... Uh, holds the consequences for the people that are not following the rules and the law. Another way to think about authority is that we look at certain people as authorities. We talked about that before. Who do you believe? Who do you follow? Who do you listen to? And so we imagine that an authority can also be someone who gives us inspiration and who gives us encouragement and who helps us to feel alive and who helps us to know that we're not alone. And so an authority might be the ones who give the rules and that keeps us accountable, or an authority might be someone that we look to for inspiration and for wisdom and for truth and guidance that can shape us and be with us. Recently, a lot of people have been focused on a young woman named Amanda Gorman. She was the 22-year-old who shared the inaugural poem a couple of weeks ago. I heard that she's going to share another poem at the Super Bowl, so even more people will listen to her. And you kind of wonder, the people that watch the inauguration and the people that watch the Super Bowl, what kind of overlap are there? Or are there a lot of people that would have done one but not the other? So her influence, her presence as an authority, someone to listen to, someone to have inspiration from and encouragement from, will grow next Sunday because she will share a poem with a new audience. So where did she get this weight? Where did she get this authority? Somehow, some way, people decided, and enough people decided, that there was some kind of a tipping point where people said, I listen to her. I look to her for truth and for guidance. She has found something. Somehow, she has been able to capture this moment and to be present to people's dreams and dreads to be present to people's pain and possibilities, that somehow this young woman has been able to get herself into a place, not by herself, but because others have noticed things in her, she got herself to a place where she has become an authority. Not one who imposes rules or holds consequences for others, but an authority that people look to, listen to, to find again that wisdom and that clarity, that solidarity, that dream, that hope for what's next. What can we do next? And so in our Hebrew scripture lesson today from Deuteronomy, we are told that the people were overwhelmed by being face to face with God. And that the people, because they were overwhelmed, they wanted to hear God, but they wanted to hear God a little bit less intensely. They wanted to be a little bit more connected to the human plane and to what they could see and feel and understand. And so God and Moses talk about how more prophets will come, that God will speak God's word in a way that the people will hear it, and then the people will echo that word 
so that the people can feel connected to that voice, not a disembodied voice, not that large voice of God that they were accustomed to hear, the fear of God, the fire of God, the commandments and the storms. People wanted a little bit less intensity. They wanted someone to come alongside of them. Maybe they weren't so interested in the authority and the power and the consequence, but they wanted something a little bit softer, something a little bit more palatable, something that they could come alongside and feel comforted and reassured by. And so God said, I will put my voice into prophets. I will put my voice into the people. And so people then can be connected in a way that's different and can listen to my voice that comes through a person. And so our New Testament lesson, our gospel lesson, it's still Mark 1. It's still the first chapter of Mark. A lot happens at the beginning of the Gospels. Jesus is born in some of the Gospels uh, intentionally with the story of his birth. Others right away talk about his baptism and beginning of his ministry and his mission and calling the disciples and going into the wilderness. So much happens at the beginning. And so today we hear this story from Mark 1 about Jesus ending up at the synagogue because he was a person of faith. He grew up in the faith. And so he had thoughts and ideas and he understood God as an authority, he understood the temple as an authority, he understood his parents as an authority, he understood the teachers, the religious leaders as authority, but he also understood that he wanted to be about a new expression of God. He wanted to help deepen and widen people's faith, not just with laws and rules and regulations, but with inspiration and encouragement, with a wisdom and a clarity, with a seeking of truth and an openness to guidance, to fresh starts and possibilities. And so in another gospel at the baptism of Jesus, we hear God break in and say, this is my beloved, this is my chosen one, this is my child, listen to him. And so we spend our time as Christians listening to Jesus, making Jesus an authority in our lives. So often Jesus doesn't tell us exactly what to think or do, sometimes he does. And sometimes he hearkens back to the Ten Commandments and to other things that he learned as a child, to the ways of authority and laws and community building. The Ten Commandments, all about community, all about our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, about keeping each other safe, about being honest in our relationships, about being focused on connection and respect and dignity and compassion for each other. But God tells the people to listen to Jesus. And so Jesus goes into the synagogue today in our gospel lesson, and he performs a miracle. He's able to take the unclean spirit out of someone. And there are lots of things that he does in the scriptures that people look at and say, that is amazing. How was he able to do that? And what does that portend for the future? And who is this Jesus? And what authority does he bring? And what authority do we grant him? What authority do we give him as we look to him and listen to him, as we follow him, as we model ourselves after him? How does he become our guidance, our truth, the way in which we model and fashion our lives and our ways? How are we obedient to him? How do we question him? How do we look at our own sense of authority? Jesus so often asked questions of the people. He said, who do you say that I am? What do you want me to do for you? He would say to them, come and see. He wanted them to have an experience. He just didn't want them to be in their head with words and a list of rules, but he wanted to have a way and he wanted to have an experience with them. And he wanted them to discern and to think and to make decisions and to figure out what and where and why and who and how would they have a sense of authority and being shaped and guided and what would the rules be and how would they fashion their lives and how would they be engaged in community. People often ask me about certain scriptures that they know. Do you think this particular scripture is coming true right now when things are happening in the world? And so I have to admit that I don't always think that, but there was a passage that I read again recently and I thought, Man, this is one of those places where I'm wondering, is this 
what's happening right now. Is this what this particular passage was speaking about? It's from 2 Timothy 4. It says, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. And here it is. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. They will have itching ears and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. So we have to figure out all the time. We have to discern and decide for ourselves what is our authority? What do we model ourselves after? What do we see as true? How do we listen to the Spirit? How do we watch Jesus? How do we allow God's Spirit to move us and shape us and encourage us? And as we look around the world, who do we listen to? What is the voice that we imagine God speaking to us through? Who is echoing the words and ways of God for us? For us as individuals, for us as a community. We are at this place in our culture. We are at this place in our congregation as we approach a budget meeting. What will our mission and ministry be like in this coming year? We're not going to figure it all out today, but we're going to talk about how do we use our resources? How do we prioritize? What is it that we're feeling called to? What is our authority? Who is guiding and shaping us? And how will we move out into the future alone and together? How will we sort out all of these competing claims and all of these truths, all of these vantage points and perspectives, how will we do that? We will do it alone and we will do it together, committed to listening to each other and sharing together what our experiences have been, what it is that we are following and listening to, what echoes of God we are hearing. Please pray with us. Holy One, we thank you that over and over again in Scripture, you give us truth and guidance, and yet sometimes we're not sure where is that truth and how do we get to it? How is it that you are shaping us and forming us and reshaping and reforming us? How is it that you can use us and mold us and make us your own? How is it that you send us toward each other? How is it that we can be community? And so again, God, we ask for your wisdom and your clarity and your patience as we seek to belong to you, as we seek to listen to you, as we seek to speak your words in the public sphere and in our faith community and in our homes and with our self-talk. Oh God, be present not only in our words, but in our actions as well. Amen. Holy One, we come with bended knee. We come because we see you as powerful. We see you as an authority. 
We come on bended knee because we don't know it all. We have a lot more to learn. We come on bended knee because we want to be humble. And we come because we want to be holy. We want to be infused by you. We want to be filled by you. We want to be nurtured and encouraged by you. We want our cups to overflow. We want to have a banquet before us. And when we have been given your gifts, we want to share them with others so that they too can feel touched, so that they can feel whole, so that they can know the truth that they are not alone, so that they too can be shaped and encouraged and guided and used for love. And so, God, we come to you now with our prayers, the ones spoken and unspoken, the people on our prayer list, the places on our prayer list. And we come with our quiet, secret prayers that other people don't know about, the ones that we don't talk about often. And you know what to do, oh God, when we come with all of those images and ideas, with all of those faces, with all of those needs, with all of that joy and celebration and gratitude. And so we thank you that you always are eager to meet us where we are, whether we are broken or standing strong and sturdy, whether we are stuck in the past, reliving memories and good old days, or we are dreaming, excited, anxious about the future, whether we are struggling in our bodies, our minds, our spirits, our relationships, or any other number of struggles, whether we are anxious or feeling like we are in sync with your spirit. And so God, hear us now as we pray aloud or silently, as we pray for ourselves and as we pray for each other, as we pray for this particular time and place, for the burdens and the possibilities that are now, and as we pray for the future, knowing that there is a future and a hope, that we are people of hope and resurrection, that we are people of the rhythms and cycles and seasons of life and faith. And so hear us now, O oh God, as we pray aloud or silently. And in one voice, O oh God, hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So I was thrilled the other day to hear that we are back on track as a nation to get Harriet Tubman put on the $20 bill. And one of my dreams and hopes is that that will happen. I was surprised when I did a little bit of research that Andrew Jackson was also a replacement on the $20 bill. So if people are concerned that it's always been that way, it's always been him on the 20, apparently that's not the case that there have been changes over time, and it's time for this change, I believe, my humble opinion, my authority, my inspiration, my encouragement says, it is time to have Harriet Tubman in a place where people can see her regularly and wonder about her, and imagine how they can be more like her, how they can be swept up with the spirit of freedom, setting others free like she was swept up in. And so um, I have a $20 bill of hers. I had it in that little, uh, ceramic case, but I failed to bring it out. So we are encouraging you to find ways to be a resource, to be encouragement, to set people free, and sometimes that means reaching out to people to help them have their basic human needs met. And sometimes giving to someone else is on a higher plane and a higher level. And so you know the people around you. You know the stories of the people in our community and across the globe who need you, who need your care, who need your compassion, who need your truth, who need your guidance, who need your good graces. And so we invite you to find ways to be engaged in generosity and in kindness and in moving beyond that me, myself, and I to be more committed to community. Please join us in our prayer of dedication, borrowing from the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the Church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
We are called, and so we go. We rise to listen to the Spirit, to listen to the ways that God pours God's self out into the voice of others, voices of strangers, voices from the past, voices from right now all around you, in a blog, in music, in creation, in tiny stirrings that are deep within you, in the voice of God that's beckoning to you from the future, inviting you in, helping you to feel safe and to feel hope and to know that there is a place that you are needed, a place where you are called, a place where you will be equipped to love and to listen more and to serve. And so go, go to bring light, go to be light, go to be the spirit of Christ in the world. Amen. I do wanted to say to those church council members and stewardship commission members that uh, it's 1058, ye of little faith, who said we'll never be done by 11. Boom. Unless my phone is wrong. Uh, but we're glad that you're with us. Uh, we are a congregation that believes all are accepted, no exceptions. We strive for limitless love, courageous action, and spirited inquiry. We want to celebrate that today is the wedding anniversary of Marilyn and Ben McDougall. They've been married 51 years. We also want to celebrate birthdays today of Molly Grisham and Mona Smith Herberg, who is our office administrator. So let's sing birth happy birthday to Molly and to Mona. We just put in the chat that we have our Zoom annual meeting, our annual budget meeting taking place in just a couple of moments, so we hope that you can follow that. Uh, the email that came out this morning at 9 o'clock also has that link, um, and so hopefully you can find yourself there at the Zoom meeting in a couple of minutes. We have opportunities for this coming week. We send that out over the weekend. We hope that you received it. If not, let us know. Worship and study and fellowship opportunities. In your bulletin, you can see more information about a couple of book studies that we're involved in, our Tuesday afternoon dialogue, our Tuesday evening dialogue group. There's also our midweek meditation. Uh, this week, instead of going live at 5 p.m., it's 5 a.m. You don't have to be there at 5 a.m. It'll just go anytime after that. But the focus is on morning, and so rather than do it at 5 p.m., we wanted to launch it early in the morning. So focusing on the possibilities that come in the morning, some of the music in the church and hymns, some scripture about morning. We also are thinking about our month of grace and prayer, individual prayer partners that's coming up, an experience, inward experience, a virtual retreat. Uh, we're inviting you to find new ways to support food pantries. One of them is through Amazon Smiles. If you shop with Amazon, a lot of you do right now especially. We want to remind you that next Sunday is, again, a Facebook Live worship. 
Our scriptures will help us to focus on healing. It's a communion Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, so we will invite you to prepare elements for communion. Bread, crackers, wine, juice, water, something that you can share at the table with us. We will have fellowship time next Sunday at 11.15, and so again on Zoom, and we hope that you can engage in that conversation. The following Sunday, the 14th, Valentine's Day, is Book Sunday. We're doing it very differently this year, but Book Sunday is February 14th. We also have an adult education speaker series that day. It's called Demystifying Our Juvenile Courts, Demystifying Our Juvenile Courts. Judge Tom Frawley, who ran the city of St. Louis juvenile courts for quite a bit of time, is going to be with us for adult ed that day. If you appreciate our ministry and our mission, if you like what you're experiencing with us online, please consider making a contribution to our general fund via PayPal on our website or a good old-fashioned check. Uh, thank you for your support of our work. Again, our annual meeting is about to begin, and so we hope that you can be with us as we chart a course for our mission and our ministry together.